Are you tired of driving your kids to G.G. Allen's grave only to be unable to find the grave because some dick stole the headstone? Well, there is a solution. The Find G.G. Allen's Grave app for Android will give you door-to-grave directions. The Find G.G. Allen's Grave app uses advanced GPS protocols to guide you with voices to the exact patch of dust and grass where G.G. took his final dirt nap. Bring the kids. Do some needle drops at the gg place on Earth. G.G. always had a huge underground following, but it's even bigger now that he's literally underground. So it's no surprise that lots of folks today take a pilgrimage to Gigi's grave. But getting there wasn't easy. Until this app. Forget Graceland, forget the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Those are plastic places for old people with jobs. Hell, even CBGB's is gone. And that former hallowed ground is now a yuppie coffee bar. The real rock and roll mecca is an unmarked patch of grass in Littleton, New Hampshire. And our free app will show you how to get there. Get the Find Gigi Allen's Grave app today. Even if you're not planning to go there soon, the app is fun. The Find G.G. Allen's Grave app is covered by the Bipcot No Government License, and it's from the good people at Beast Lick Internet Policy Commission Outreach Team, who also brought you Fiend Phone, the Freedom Fiends Radio app, Bipcot, Meow Bit, and of course, Truth, Justice, American Way. The Find G.G. Allen's Grave app is free. Get it today on the Google Play Store or on Amazon. Your family will thank you. And don't forget to rate and review. Worms, eating G.G. Allen's face. That's our word, brought to you by Bipcot and Fiendfo. Oh, that's a great new pack on this weekend. And, uh, yeah, so we're also brought to you by um, Freedom Bed and Breakfast, which is Ben Stone's new um, project, along with Jim Davidson, where they're setting up a bed and breakfast app for uh, libertarians and freedom lovers, uh, all the like. And, uh, and right now they're doing an Indiegogo campaign to raise money to help build the app. Uh, sounds like a really interesting project. I can't wait to see what happens. You can learn more at hobosymbols.com, which is an odd name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or you can go directly to the Indiegogo campaign because I set up like a subdomain. It's um, freedombed.lulberts.com. And I am here with Jim Babb. Uh, the, the one person that everybody goes... I want to hear more Bab, and then when I put up polls, nobody votes for you. It just it does it, it's beyond me. But you're the only person people insist I have on. You and Matt, actually. All right. So I don't know. All right. Well, weird. I'm glad I have. I, I'm glad I have some uh, a loyal faction out there. Yeah, you have a loyal faction of people who are dedicated to not voting, even when it comes to non-government voting systems. <laughs> <laughs> that's see that's that's just shows how effective I have been. Yeah. 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 So you instant messaged me and you said we should talk about two different things tonight. You said one we should talk about the fascist infiltration into the liberty movement and we should also talk yeah, about Let's just start with there. Let's well, just start with that. Hold on. And then the other thing you wanted to talk about was the peop- libertarians um deviating from their ideals uh, and drinking Budweiser by drinking Budweiser. And I'm like, isn't that the same topic? <laughs> I think yes. it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, so what do you think that's been going on with all this stuff? I know Richard Spencer's been really trying to get more libertarians to kind of come out of that whole movement and get more into the alternative right kind of sphere, the <laughs> – Ethno nationalist uh, movement, um, pa- paleo libert- paleo anarcho capitalism, all that stuff. What say you? Uh, well, it's you know, there's so many questions in there, but I thought maybe to to sort of frame this, I'd, I have a quote from from Jeffrey Tucker, and I, and I think it sort of highlights some of the problems that we're having. He says, as for those fixed principles, sometimes we are wrong. Then we adjust and find new ones. Mm -hmm. And he says, it took me a few minutes to adapt. I could feel what was happening. My whole new sense of how the world works was falling apart. I had been wrong, desperately wrong, fundamentally wrong for as long as I can remember. Now, at first I thought, you know, what he's he's describing like Stefan Molyneux becoming a Trump supporter. Mm -hmm. Um, But this was him becoming a bud drinker. So, but I think it is a... (laughs) 
I think there's a sort of a parable in in this story about him becoming a bud drinker that, that maybe could be applied on a, on a to a broader topic. Um, is he talking about Bud or Bud Light? Because I mean, they're all they're both terrible, but I mean, I think one is objectively way worse than the other. Well, uh, I believe he was talking about Bud Budweiser. I guess just Proper. regular Budweiser, or isn't it just called America now? Or didn't they change? <laughs> I think that? they changed it back. Oh, they changed it back. Yeah, America got mad. <laughs> you know what? Like back in the day, Budweiser used to be an all malt beer, and then they started using adjuncts because it was cheaper. And I've been always saying we should try to get Budweiser to go back to their old formula, make it good again. So when they had their their uh, <laughs> when they had their campaign to make it America, I was really pressing everybody to remember that we should really press Anheuser Busch to make America great again. Yeah, you know, I, or just skip it. <laughs> no, I, neither one is really going to happen. And I don't really think that Budweiser was ever probably great. Um, anyway, but this uh, article was, we're bet, referencing I bet in comparison was it is great <laughs> to what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the article we're talking about is I'll Never Sneer at Budweiser Again by Jeffrey Tucker. And, you know, at, this came at a time when we've seen so many libertarians lose their way, right? I mean, you know, years ago it was Molyneux jumped on the Trump train and uh, Walter Block and, and you know, so many we've, – we've lost some some pretty heavy libertarians along the way as they've reconsidered their principles mm -hmm. and <laughs> decided they were previously wrong and, and embraced um, something that w had been previously considered offensive. Mm -hmm. So – uh, I don't know. Is that is that a is that a problem in libertarian circles? Because I'm seeing I've been seeing some weird, kind of some weird people show up in uh, libertarian conferences lately, and I have not. I just been. wonder have is you? this. Have you been around? Well, um, since I just been hearing some of these stories. The one was the 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 one that got a lot of press was that guy uh, David Spencer, or Richard Spencer, who crashed the. Richard, uh, Richard Spencer. Spencer, sorry, yeah. sorry, David Spencer, whoever you are, <laughs> Richard Spencer, he sh he crashed the International Students for Liberty conference. Is that um, and was asked to leave uh, appropriately? I thought you know that was the right response. If you're having a liberty conference, why would you want to have you know an, a, someone with an extreme authoritarian view be there? Um, but anyway, so he showed up, tried to cause a ruckus, and uh, was asked to leave. But then, you know, then I see um, a clip from Anarchopulco. Okay, I've been seeing all these great, you know, stuff coming out of Anarchopulco. And uh, and then here's this woman. Um, Lauren Southern. La Laura I, Southern, I, this is going. I think is her name. <laughs> yeah, okay? Lauren Southern. And she's doing a speech on nationalism mm -hmm. at Anarchopulco. Yep. And and I'm like, what what is going on <laughs> <laughs> and it takes Lauren Southern uh, to do a speech about nationalism for Adam Kokesh to be the voice of reason. <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's <laughs> <laughs> It was creepy. You yeah. know, it was the, it was the creepy it was a creepy level that would send Adam Kokesh to the parking lot, you know. <laughs> just just <laughs> just so revolting and distasteful. Uh, or just and I just, but I couldn't figure out what it was doing at an at an Arcapulco. and I thought, well, you know, it's a fluke, you know, w why not? Then I, I see an announcement she was a really from Jeff Burwick that he's she, for an invite for a that, speaker. Well, now yeah. he's. Did you see he's uh, Jeff Berwick uh, uh, was making comments about a possible tour coming up, where he's going to tour with a few of these speakers, including the Nationalist, wow. and I. <laughs> I, I don't get it. C can you explain it to me? I don't. Well, see, there's a lot of kind of. I mean, Lauren Southern has a huge fan base, even within libertarians, even within libertarians who don't agree with her nationalist views. Um, I I see some value in it. I do. Uh, so a lot. Of, well, same with a lot of the other. Maybe you could break it down for me. Is it is it the philosophy that says, well, I'm so scared of government that I need to have a government? Yeah. Oh, or. Okay. On most other things, she's fairly libertarian. There's a few things where she kind of gets into the conservative sphere, kind of into the nationalist sphere as well. But for for the most part, they're very libertarian. So I could see why, if you're going to have a libertarian conference, you might want to bring her on. But when you're specifically specifically targeting anti-state libertarians, she's probably not the right demographic. 
to do a speech, maybe to show <laughs> up, maybe to field questions, or maybe to be with someone else. But I, I don't think that she would be like a great keynote speaker. It's kind of like having David Sununu uh, speak at the Liberty Forum. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like that. Did they do that? They, uh, they probably did was, that. I, it was I don't like know. one of the earlier ones. Yeah, <laughs> one of the earlier ones when they first kind of were getting started. But yeah, like well, so, I, I see some value. Okay, in it, so she's but, libertarian, yeah. libertarian, Ish. but pro state. Is that? Is yeah. that? I don't know. Yeah, she's okay. she's a like she's a conservatarian, kind of probably a little bit more nationalist than someone like Stephen Crowder or uh, get way more than uh, not as much as Gavin McGinnis. Gavin McGinnis was is really kind of nation nationalisty, but um, yeah, I mean, like she she even described herself as a libertarian a few times. So, mm. um, oh, who was that guy on Facebook that that came out and said that he's a an anarchist nationalist oh, i forget his name you, you know i i, I this but guy i thing. forget he was it's like even got a wiki page he was like all he's been all over facebook whatever and and like what <laughs> well see, there's there is there there is I, I can understand where they're coming from but that if they're gonna have a big community and they can use private property rights to exclude people they don't want from their private property. I understand that. I understand there's going to be like communities and all different kinds of well, stuff. Well, they say that nation, it doesn't mean state. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they think that's a big differentiation. Like when we're putting our nation together, it's going to be based on race, not politics. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, in that case, uh, I, let me applaud you. Um, <laughs> what the hell are they talking about? Such. <laughs> Such collectivist nonsense. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I hate statism maybe because it's collectivist. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, that, and there's maybe other forms of collectivism that are that are just as, as idiotic. And, uh, you know, the, the ethno-nationalists, I, 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 just, I just can't stand them. I, I, can't even, I can't even fathom why these people are tolerated, especially in libertarian circles. And, but yet... We see. I, I guess I don't know. Are there that many of them, or is it just that every once in a while one shows up and they and they're so loud that they seem to be having more influence than they yeah. are? So way back when, like back when Tassas and I were making YouTube videos, there was a guy named. Uh, you probably may be familiar with some of his videos. Like, uh, but his name was Fringe Elements, and there was also a couple other people like Observer uh, or Over Overbrain. And what they uh, they used to kind of talk about this stuff way back when, even when they were libertarians. Um, and he uh, uh, specifically um, fringe elements kind of ended up turning into a fascist, and he used that term unabashedly, <laughs> like later on. And everybody was kind of like, "What the hell happened? Like we did not see this coming." It's like you really didn't see that coming. Like he he stopped talking about libertarianism like six months ago and just completely started going on this rampage against other YouTubers criticizing his race realism stuff. Of course, this was going to happen. I mean, of course that you saw this coming down the pike. And um, and me and Matt were talking about this for a long time. Now they are kind of a like a very fringe minority, like fr very fringe. But when you have the media who's looking for an explanation about why someone like someone such a horrible candidate as Trump could possibly be winning. They had to pick a, uh, a whipping boy and the whipping boy they chose was the alt right. And they gave them a platform. And now that they have a platform. They're starting to get sure. a little bit of momentum, but really they're still on the fringes. They're really, I don't, I don't think I've ever ran into one in real life. <laughs> I mean, like I've run into libertarians, but not into, uh, not into alt righties. But you know, well, do if, they do they announce themselves? I mean, are you expecting to see uh, Pepe the Frog lapel pins? Or I mean, wh how would you notice that alt right person in line behind you at the supermarket? Uh, I'm <laughs> well, I mean, I've met people in the in they so flash a gang sign. What I mean, what is it? <laughs> well, you know, they they enter you know, when you talk to people. I, I talk to people in libertarian circles. I have not met these alt right people, um, at least not in real life. I I met Trump supporters, but they would not say. Oh, they would say, "Oh no, we're not alt right." That's about it. Like I don't run into these people. They they're not they're not really. Well, I guess the term popular. is vague enough now that are are there. Who is calling themselves alt right now? It's kind of a, 
it's kind of a a, a tarnished phrase now. Yeah. Is anybody calling themselves that anymore? You, I don't think even like Breitbart people are. Or yeah, the so. Breitbarts, the Milo, even Lauren Southern used to call herself alt right, and then everybody started correcting her, like, no, alt right means ethno nationalists. That's what that term means. That's why Richard Spencer devised this term. He wanted to separate himself from the rest of the right, and and so people were like, oh, okay, well, I'm just not going to use that term anymore. Breitbart started stopped using it. All these other kind of people stop using it. But the people who are really in the bag for ethno-nationalism, they don't care. They're like, of course I'm an ethno-nationalist. Why would I steer from that term? <laughs> so, yeah, they, they'll, they'll, they'll gladly admit it. But yeah, the Pepe Le Pen pins, that's a thing. Amazon sells them. How does how do they end up mixing? I'm still confused about how they end up getting mixed up with with anarchists. And that guy, try to remember that guy's name from Facebook who who announced boldly that he's a uh, anarchist nationalist. And I just really couldn't even figure. Okay, so he, but he's uh, this this trying to merge these two together. It it just makes no sense. So I'm kind of perplexed by it, but I've also seen it uh, locally here in Pennsylvania. They're having a, a Liberty Conference as, affiliated with the Libertarian Party in Harrisburg on April 1st. So one of the featured speakers, however, it's mostly, you know, like Libertarian Party people and, and guys like that. But one of the speakers is the famous uh, goat blood drinking um, Saul Invictus. Performance artist, yeah. <laughs> <a> eugenicist <laughs> uh, from Florida, who is one of the featured speakers, an mm -hmm. actual eugenicist. And my friend Steve is is actually is actually the one that hired him. Steve Sheets. I'm like when I, I was like he had made some comment about him being invited and he was coming to this, and I private messaged him, like, what? Are you serious? Is he really coming? He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, I said, but he's a he's a eugenicist. He's like, oh no, he's not. I'm like, dude. Yeah, he, he just came read. out with a video not too long ago describing himself as a uh, neo reactionary. And I'm like, I thought that term was kind of discarded now that the alt right's a thing. I wonder what they're going to call themselves next. But <laughs> what is it? What it? What could it? What is a neo reactionary? So the, I, I guess I don't. I, I, I don't know what that would be. Yeah, this sort of came out of the whole Mencius Molbug uh, blog, who was a software developer. He still is a software developer. He didn't die. But he's a software developer who was running this blog under a, under the pseudonym uh, Mencius Molbug. I can't remember his real name for the life of me. But he uh, he ran a blog, and he was basically kind of preaching these kind of fascist ideals uh, and all the stuff that comes with it, ethno-nationalism, like actual fascism, not like economic fascism, need a dictator or a monarch, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and the whole and he called it kind of like uh, the dark enlightenment, and so people started calling themselves neo reactionary or dark enlightenment, um, and that's what originally kind of sparred the whole alt right thing, and then it kind of moved into libertarianism and other fields, and that whole umbrella is what it's called the alt right, the ethno nationalist groups, which there are many. There's not just even Nazis are in proper proper Nazis are in it as well, you know swastikas and everything. Uh, so there's a broad range. You you pick your economic flavor, and there's an alt right there's an alt right group for you somewhere. <laughs> but hmm. the, so the guy's name is Chase Rachel. That's the one you were talking about. The one that came out as an uh, anarcho nationalist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's the anarcho nationalist. Um, okay. So is 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 he an ethno nationalist or what does it mean? Or what, that people they they create this nation, but like no, it's not a it's not the state. It's a nation of what. Uh, racially homogeneous nation. So, like, someone someone was telling me he knew this Chase guy, and he seemed like he was a good person, but he's just really bad with psychology, sociology, and might be an actual sociopath. But he's but he's but he's a really good, nice guy. Okay, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but the ethno nationalists they they they're trying to distinguish themselves from like the white nationalist or white supremacist kind of label. Uh, but it's pretty much the same thing, except they want a, like a peaceful exclusion from races but the problem is when you when you talk about like peaceful so there's this book called um uh seeing like a state and it kind of talks about like these high modernist societies you know the technocrats and you know the extreme communists who try to come in and reorganize society in their vision and it always fails and it always turns into authoritarianism even even if 
they exp- explain like, oh, no, we're not going to be authoritarian. We're going to do this all voluntarily. Uh, it always turns into that because when you have like like this the system where like let's say they need steel or iron ore uh and the guy owns an iron ore and he's the only place they can get iron ore and he goes no i'm not going to give up my stuff so you can live in your little communist utopia kick rocks they have two choices they can be like oh well that's it we tried <laughs> let's move along and go back mm. to the old system or they can say this guy is an enemy to humanity he wants us all to die in, in poverty uh, we're going to go take his stuff. And that's the kind of what the happens. And that's, that will end up happening as well with ethno-nationalism because they're going to say, okay, this black guy doesn't want to voluntarily give up his house and leave his, you know, the area that he knows so well. Uh, so we're going to have to physically remove them. And they already have the mechanization right. or build, to Or put up the them. walls yeah. or, or build build walls and, and shoot people that want to come into a different zone, uh, even if they're invited. Um, so... I can see where you know the philosophy obviously is it's an authoritarian philosophy from the root and the the idea though that of people that want to centrally plan I mean it's the central planners mm-hmm. okay libertarians are, should be the first to recognize that central plans always go wrong okay like your central plan sucks I don't care how smart you are what your intentions are what how noble of a person you are who's on your team as soon as you start trying to plan other people's lives in any way okay it's a disaster right i mean c- can libertarians basically consider that to be an axiom yeah i guess okay so imagine the idea of these eugenicists that are like not only going to centrally plan like society and their their culture and all of that stuff but they take it a step further and feel they have a duty to actually shape the dna of future generations Mm -hmm. okay to centrally plan the characteristics that they want to see on humanity you know like genetically engineer um the rest of humanity okay well i think that may be just the nazis maybe the kkk i'm not kkk believes some wild stuff but the, the, well, the, no, well, no. The this Aryans guy that really is do. being invited to a libertarian convention in Pennsylvania shares this Saul view. Invictus. Okay, yeah. okay. Now, now, and I, I want to just read one thing. Okay, now, later he did a sort of a semi um, disclaimer on this, um, but it's really like, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. I really meant it. Okay, <laughs> what he says is. Specifically, we have a duty to implement legislation to prevent the births of persons with mental retardation, inheritable diseases, severe physical handicaps, and psychological disorders. In other words, we have a duty to implement through state legislation an official eugenics program. Okay? Now, he, in his, in his uh, later disclaimer, he says, now that he's a politician for libertarians, he says, no, no, I, I really, no, I, I, I'm taking back the part about legislation. But then goes on to say that there is nothing about the, the goal itself uh, that he disagrees with. So I guess he's, I don't know, he's got another way of centrally planning humanity that he feels might be more effective than using the the legislature oh action t4 that's that's what i was looking for action t4 that was the uh was the uh, post-war designation program for the involuntary euthanasia in nazi germany where they exterminated people who were uh mentally retarded uh people with physical handicaps that couldn't work or deemed incurably sick or um yeah and they considered it a or, or psychological disorders. Mm-hmm. About, I mean, that's one of the, and I think there was another thing I read where he talks about, you know, wanting people to be attractive and, you know, and have the right psychological, you know, uh, characteristics. Then why did they hang out with Cantwell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on, come on. But so I understand why guys like this exist. He can exist by being outrageous and the more outrageous he is, the more people freak out when he shows up. Yeah. Okay, great. Same with that uh, Spencer dude. Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna go trigger those libertarian snowflakes. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Let's go make a scene. Blah blah blah. And let's see what we can see. What kind of shit we can stir up. Yeah, and that whole okay. kind of met, that whole kind of tactics started 
unintentionally from Ben Shapiro, who just wanted to go into colleges and, and speak. And he's a very abrasive and he's very straightforward. He, he's, he doesn't beat around the bush. He's very upfront. If he thinks you're an idiot, he's going to call you an idiot. And Milo was like, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to be just like that, except not as smart and not as clever. <laughs> and just goes up and says, like, oh, feminism is cancer. And, oh, we just need, like, here's the number for ICE. Report, like, any immigrations you see. Just, just, just being as provocative as he can. Saying right. things that are, yeah. And then everybody gets talking, and then he gets more popular, and they have big riots, and then, you know, his name blows up. And then, you know, they right. find, they the find cycle, him on Joe and the Rogan cycle advocating continues. banging 13-year-olds. but. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, that's none of my business. But that's yeah. none of my but, business. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so the funny thing is, so what? So right. So how do we how do we address them? Okay. If they show up at our thing now, all they want is to is for people to freak out. Okay. They look like, see, we're here. We triggered those libertarians. Ha ha ha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got two choices. You can ignore them. OK, but that 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 often might come across as accepting them. Yeah. OK, which is also completely unacceptable. So but I also don't want to feed into what they want, just the attention. OK, so so this guy coming to this thing in, in Pennsylvania, I just basically I just canceled my ticket. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I, I was listed as a speaker. I don't think I'm listed as a speaker anymore. So. <laughs> I just kind of separated myself. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to make a big stink about it necessarily. Um, one, because the, the organizer is my friend. <laughs> He's just really screwed up. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I don't know. You know, you know, should should a big stink be made that he's a featured speaker and and, you know, and try to try to rally yeah. people to to denounce him it's like that's just what he wants like how boring well, anyway i think there's a way of doing it and doing it right the way jeffrey tucker did it um i don't think he was aiming to be like that i think i think he had something else in mind i think he was trying to speak to a broad audience but it came out like screeching like re you know <laughs> you know that whole kind of re meme uh, so it kind of came out like he was like a freaking out, like a like a social justice warrior, and that's that's a bad way of doing it, in my opinion. I think a better way of doing it is just, you know, contacting the the hotel staff and say like this guy is not invited. He's here to be a pro provocateur. Look at what yeah, he's but what doing do you do here. when he is invited? Here's yeah, the problem. Yeah, yeah. This guy is invited. Yeah. Okay. He. <laughs> But I'm and just because I'm, I'm just saying because I returned my ticket, yeah. I'm no longer invited. Yeah. So I, I, he has all the standing. I have none anyway. So yeah, I, I would I would well I think the only point that I was getting here at is not to just to go into the hotel lobby bar and screech because <laughs> that, that yeah. doesn't look good. And Richard Spencer kind of I don't I don't I wouldn't say he had the upper hand because he was invited and he was asked to leave by hotel management, not the conference people. By hotel, they made that decision on their own. Uh, but at the same time, it did look kind of bad that he was down there screeching, which I love Jeffrey Tucker. And I understand why he did that, because the media was there and all they had to do is go, look, here's our whipping boy right here. And he's at these Conference of Libertarians. How can we spin this to make libertarians look terrible? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, think about it. Don't libertarians. I mean, we, we have it hard enough. Yeah. We have it hard enough trying to defend libertarianism for what libertarianism actually is. Yeah. Do, do, how do you want to start a conversation explaining libertarianism by first going, but we're not all fascists. <laughs> now, let me tell you what libertarianism is. OK, who who wants that, you know, added on to to, you know, what they're trying to explain? No, thanks. No, I, thanks. I guess the best way you could start out by saying, like, just like socialists, not all of us are fascists. Because <laughs> then yeah, that we're puts really, them in an awkward We're really going to reach like, an understanding now. We've uh, really got off. We're, we're really going to be this some clear thinking going on. There I mean, is one thing us and socialists have in common. N most of us aren't fascists. <laughs> <laughs> if you start from that proposition, then the reporter's like, Oh, I can't do the story now. <laughs> <laughs> but it is these guys, you know, let's face it. If these people didn't exist, 
the 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 left critics would have to invent them. So mm -hmm. whenever they see any of these guys, they are going to go out of their way to this is going to be the front page headline about the, your libertarian conference. It's not going to be about the 99 percent libertarians that were there. It's going to be about the one percent ridiculous idiot fascist who had no business being there to begin with. Mm hmm. And so but they kind of thrive on that because they, they realize that people were calling people like Mitt Romney and John McCain uh, and all these people racist. And there was no justification for this. It's just that they had policy disagreements with them. So the left have been calling anybody with an R after their name. And, of course, libertarians are just Republicans who smoke weed. So they're clearly racist, too. Everybody's racist, 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 racist. We're going to find anything that's racist and we're going to throw it at you and call you racist, sexist, homophobic, misogynist. Whatever est they can throw at you, they're going to throw at you. We've got newsletters from 1972. Yeah, that were written by a ghostwriter. Lou <laughs> <The> Rockwell. <laughs> I, no, I think I think Michael actually figured out who it was. It was some other. Oh, guy. who is it? It was some other guy. Oh. I guess he. I guess he's now. He's kind of. He's he's a little bit. He's been a little bit more open fashy since then. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but I guess he he had like a. He got mad at Michael Dean one day and sent him like a pretty nasty letter that included all kinds of racial slurs, if I recall correctly. Anyways. And you did a like a pattern analysis, and, yeah. and it was the same as the Ron Paul <laughs> newsletters. I think he even. I think he admitted that he did it. Um. Anyways, he uh, lost my train of thought here. Uh, oh yeah, so like you know, they've been they, everybody. All of us have been called racist so many times now that we're all kind of desensitized to it. Like when people call me a racist now, I used to bend over backwards to show that I was not racist and say like, no, uh, you know, I have friends, I have black friends, I you know, I I constantly work around all kinds of different ethnicities. Like that would that would not be <laughs> possible for me. I would not be able to function in this current life. Uh, if I was racist, but now I don't even care. It's like you want to call me racist. I'm just like, okay, sure, whatever. Because it's it's gotten so desensitized, and no one cares about it anymore. It's 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 not even it. It doesn't bother people anymore. They just kind of roll their eyes. Even people who are like, you know, way not racist will roll their eyes when they when they hear someone accuse other people being racist because it's been used so much. Right. So, so now when an when an ethno nationalist shows actually up. shows up. And it's like, eh. Yeah, it's like, oh, racist. Oh, this again. <laughs> We're going down this route again. And then, of course, but like, this well, time what they actually, actually have saying? a breeding program and uh, a forced breeding program and, and sterilizations in mind. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, now the left are like calling like Milo a white national, a white supremacist. And I'm like, this is just crazy. Like, I, I really don't like Milo, <laughs> but this is insane. This is not a valid criticism of the guy. <laughs> well, and as he usually says, just just look at the dudes in my bedroom. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> how can you say I'm racist? <laughs> He's like, I had a little bit of black in me, actually, <laughs> last night. <laughs> right now. Yeah. yeah as we speak. <laughs> uh, yeah. The yeah. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> what is but what is up with these libertarians that think this could possibly be a good idea? This guy, um, the the eugenicist, was also in, I think he was invited to Liberty Fest NYC. This, he was he was a speaker there, mm -hmm. which is not known for having like anarchist presenters and whatnot, but it's usually pretty good, you know. Um, but, why do why do libertarians sometimes I hear an argument that libertarians feel a need like well listen we want to debate them we we want to debate their yeah we're going to bring them in and uh, we're going to debate them and show them they're wrong okay well, I'm all for debating them open up a YouTube channel and debate them the the worst yeah, idea or, that you can do is bring them onto a, a huge platform like going to a large convention. Their conventions right. are or, really or go to really their small. convention. They're, well, yeah, but have you how seen many, their how many libertarians? <laughs> how many libertarians are getting invited to come do a talk on libertarianism at like a white nationalist event? Yeah, exactly. Right? They're not. No, they're not looking. They're not looking to, um, you know, to to spread libertarianism in their circles. Right. No. How, how about this? <laughs> Let's just take it out out of the fringes for a bit and say, how many Republicans did you see at the DNC giving a speech? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, half. I don't know. <laughs> the answer is zero, unless okay. unless that unless that Republican is going to go up there and say very un-Republican things. Like that's 
I think they did the same thing at the Republican convention. Back when I was a statist, I used to watch this stuff. But there was a, a, a Republican convention like in 2004. And there was a Democrat who was basically just a Republican. But he was still on the Democratic ticket because he was still trying to bring back the Dixiecrats. Like, okay. And he gave a speech and was like, yeah, my Democratic colleagues are idiots. It's like, no, actually, you're the idiot for hanging around them. <laughs> like, what are you doing? But, yeah, but... The, the, if you're, if you, yeah, they have they have their own conventions and they're very small. Nobody goes to them. Uh, well, there's some, but if you did you see the, uh, the was it the National Policy Institute? I think that's what it's called. Their convention where everybody was throwing up the hail things. Compare that the to hail, oh the hail Trump. Yeah, the hail Trump <laughs> salutes. Yeah. And then compare Creepy. that to like Jeffrey Tucker's speech at Freedom Fest, where you know it's a huge auditorium, <laughs> massive auditorium with lots of people in it. You know, where you're right. debating Wayne Allen Root. The, the, like the comparisons are. Wait, Wayne Allen Root is yeah. still around? What? Unfortunately, <laughs> I bumped into him and uh, Bob Barr. <laughs> and I was oh! like, I was, I was, I, I should have got a picture. <laughs> but the little, were they? Were the they with the? Were, were they with the Haitian delegation? Um, <laughs> who was that guy that, that Bob Barr works for now? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, yeah, that former Haitian dictator. Remember? Oh no, no, <laughs> I don't know. This is, this is news to me. <laughs> oh, I'm googling it while while you talk. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. Here we go. Bob Barr was a reason why I originally left the LP. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, you got rid of oh, what was her name? Mary Ruart, they she was, she was almost kind of considered to be like the winner, and then Bob Barr came on, and then everybody was like, "Oh no, Republicans are uh, they're going to kind of be oogly eyed over the fact that he's got some you know clout in Washington and could possibly get elected." Yeah, right. <laughs> then they're going to go for that, and they did, and uh, they set, oh they jumped on it. Yeah, they, they jumped on that. They sent me. Some oh, this sort- is Jean Jean Claude Duvalier. Mm-hmm. Do you know who I'm talking about? No. Baby Doc, president of Haiti from 1971 until his overthrow in 1986. Seems um, Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's who Bob Barr was working for last I knew. <laughs> I'm not making it up. Uh, so a libertarian is working with socialist dictators. Nice. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you he remember, been but... President. Um, do you remember Ron Ron Crickenberger? No. With the with the Libertarian Party, um, he's deceased now. But uh, like when I first kind of heard of the LP, he was a he was a, an active voice, and they had a campaign to target the worst of the worst drug warriors in the country in Congress. Mm-hmm. And they they're like, why don't we instead of you know scattering our efforts, why don't we pick the worst congressman on the drug war, just the worst one we can find, and we're all going to pile on and kick his ass, okay? So you know who they picked? Who? Bob Barr. <laughs> <laughs> they actually kicked his ass, and he lost the election. They jumped. They just. They just. They ran commercials like showing how cruel he was to to medical marijuana patients or something like that. Like, and they were part of his downfall. So, and and then it was like four years later. He's he's the spokesperson. <laughs> Yeah, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but that that they sent me some sort of like magazine or something. The LP did, and it said like we we picked our new nominee, and you know we're gonna try to focus on getting Republicans in. And I'm like, great. Oh, you sent me one of these. Um, what is, you know the those little uh, envelopes they'll give you sometimes. It says like, oh, if you want to donate money, put a check in here and send it back to us in the post. It's free. So I put like a uh-huh. piece of letter in there, and I was like. I, pull my name from all of your crap. I don't want to be involved with it anymore. How the hell could you be <laughs> pick Bob Barr <laughs> of all people <laughs> as to be your uh, presidential candidate? I want nothing to do with you and sent it back. And right. uh, I but stopped you know, getting I stopped getting messages from them. It was it was fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it worked. Yeah. You should have just put a put tape you what I do is I take a business reply envelope and I tape it to a brick and I put that <laughs> in the mailbox. Because they gotta pay all the postage on that too. Oh man, is that? Do they really... <laughs> I'm not saying you should do that to the LP. That's pretty mean spirited. I, I make fun of them, but yeah, do it to them too. Screw them. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
if if they nominate Will Cooley, I'll I'll refrain from gluing their things to bricks and mailing it to them. Uh, <laughs> well, so then. so Will Co- so yeah. Speaking of Will, he's coming to Pennsylvania for this event that's uh, featuring um, the the eugenicist. And when he heard when he heard the eugenicist was coming, he uh, evidently he had some. Uh, words with the organizer Steve and said, "You know, I, I'm still willing to speak at this, but I, I get a chance to rebut. I, I want a chance to rebut um, what the eugenicist says. So um, now I think there's some kind of debate, maybe on immigration or something, that's going to be Will Coley versus the 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 central planner of humanity. Um, <laughs> central okay, planner you know, genetics." <laughs> like, I don't know. It's probably not even going to be a, a, the kind of structured debate where one side can win. They'll, they'll, they'll just probably argue about different things, and yeah. um, which you know brings up a real gripe I have. And I want to use this opportunity to spread the word to everyone hosting libertarian debates. Okay, you got to start with a resolution, and one side says they support it, and the other side says they don't. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have that to begin with. No one can win, and it can go on forever. And then, and and then, because uh, I saw this recently, Larkin Rose versus Victor Pross, oh. formerly anarchist artist. <laughs> now, formerly, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, this guy. Now, <laughs> I, now I'm gonna, I'll get into a diatribe about Victor's Pross, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, na- he's he still thinks he's an anarchist, but needs uh, national border enforcement. Okay, so. Right. This but my is, this Western culture. Shouldn't, what is this Western culture? Mm. Yeah, this <laughs> debate shouldn't have lasted more than about ten minutes. Yeah. Right. Like that, you could easily just you know if they had set up a parameter like you know are is border enforcement um, compatible with the non-aggression principle? You know, yes or no. Right. Mm-hmm. You could you could you could establish that in like minutes. Yeah. Instead, they went on, and then the shit talking on Facebook continued. Both sides patting themselves on the back for being correct and and destroying that idiot opponent. But in reality, is um, there was no resolution because they never because they started off wrong. Yeah. So and good debate. Start your debate right and end it quick. Yeah. Good debates usually start off with we have our opponent over here. He supports the resolution that. Uh, anarchists should not support a border wall. And over here, we have so and so who thinks that uh, that there should be a border wall. And those are the resolution. And he's going to be arguing on the affirmative, and he's going to be arguing on the negative. So let's begin with open statements. That's how you do it. And then you come to yeah, conclusions. Yeah, because Q- otherwise, E-1-A. otherwise, halfway in, you get one guy saying, "Well, I never said there should be a border wall. I'm yeah. just concerned about my culture, <laughs> and I want to talk about. I want to talk about. You know, yeah. what? Shut up." Sorry, you know, like you don't even know what you're there to argue about, and then you're just going to weasel around. Like, it's just it's just boring content wise. Yeah. So, so Victor Pross. Anyway, are you familiar with who this guy is at all? Have you been? Well, I've known him on Facebook for I don't know five years, maybe. He's okay. been around a long time, but I I'm, I can't say I'm like uh, personally uh, associated with him. He since had defriended me. Um, oh yeah, I'm sure you said for any something like negative. arguments or anything we had. I'm sure you said something just, negative about Molyneux, and that was that was enough to get the block. Yep. <laughs> it, no, no, I, I survived all of the Molyneux stuff. I had asked him questions trying to clarify his position in that in that quote unquote debate. Oh, okay. I just said, you know, I said, you know, you can, you know, the confusion. He was making fun of of uh, Larkin Rose uh, followers, you know, like mm-hmm. people that that support Larkin's position are his followers, not just people that are also anarchists. Yeah, by the way, I, I, have he, say, like, um, I have some criticisms of Larkin Rose. I'm not particularly a big fan of it. I know that you are, and that's fine. And I, my, my criticism of his is not the same as criticism as like Jeff Berwick or someone I consider like a fraud or a scammer. He's not. He's, he's I'm sure he's a wonderful guy. I just, I just. Well, let's work on Victor him. first, yeah. then we'll get to Larkin. <laughs> but I was just, I was just going to say, <laughs> but I support his position i saw that debate and i was like okay i'm on i i agree with larkin rose so am i a follower of larkin rose now according to victor Pross? uh not really I'm no not, you're no yeah. <laughs> so but anyway yeah. my, my point was that victor was expressing confusion why larkin's followers don't understand what victor's trying to say 
Why are they so stupid? Why don't they understand me? And I said, well, you know, to clear up the confusion, could you just break it down for us? Okay. Exactly what do you want to have happen at the border? Just explain it to me physically. What do you think should be going on there? Okay. Watch the crickets, video. crickets, yeah. crickets, <laughs> crickets. Just, no, what, do you, what exactly are you talking about? Crickets, crickets. I can't believe these people are so stupid. <laughs> could you... But could you explain it? Crickets, 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 you know? Yeah. Ugh. So, yeah, Victor Pross, uh, anarchist artist, um, he was like a huge Molinuvian guy, a huge, huge Molinuvian. Like anything that Molyneux said, he, he totally agreed with 100%. And I had some like debates with him over like defooing and stuff like that, but never really went anywhere. Like, you know, like whatever. Uh, and until it came to the point where the whole DMCA thing happened and he just wasn't having any of that, he couldn't he couldn't believe for one second that Molyneux would dare violate the non-aggression principle. <laughs> and he, he blocked me and all this other stuff. And there was a person that who I used to kind of work with, not really work with. It's probably the wrong word. Like we used to kind of collaborate on, on, on information and stuff when we used to make fun of the zeitgeist movement, Justin Templer. Uh, he, uh, he went and he was like, all right, so who is this Victor Pross person anyway? Uh, Cause he just really wanted to know what, what he was about. And he started digging through some of his stuff and he was like, okay, so he didn't paint this painting. This painting was painted like 20 years prior <laughs> when Michael Jackson was still like super popular by this artist. And he, he, there was a lot of his stuff that he would just flat out plagiarized. Um, he, he would post like these long. Wait, he's he. Are you saying he's showing? He displays paintings that are not his own, as yeah. and yeah. as his there own. There was a specific. Remember the one specific one that I. There's some that he has done for sure, but there was specifically one that I remember that he pulled up. It was a Michael Jackson one, and he Google image searched it, and it came back to some other artist that painted it like 20 years before he was, you know, trying to make the rounds as a painter. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Whoa. And uh, one of the other, some of the other things he did a lot was he would take articles, and like he'll take two articles, copy and paste the stuff that he likes from it, and then post them into one article and kind of shuffle it so you couldn't tell. But Justin started figuring out like, okay, if I just Google search this sentence, I can find what these articles were, and was actually showing the original article, the two articles that he was ripping from, or the one article he was ripping from, and show like how he was like shuffling the, st <laughs> the article to make it look original. Um, there, was, uh, there was times where he would show, like, like, like it would be like a picture of someone drawing. Like, you couldn't see the, you know, the person. You just see the arm drawing a character at a party because he does character drawings at parties. That's, that's his main gig, allegedly. Uh -huh. And... He would Google image search that and it would come back as some other caricature artist in like a different part of the country. And when he contacted him and said, hey, someone is using your picture <laughs> and saying that it's you, uh, say that it's him. And he was like, oh, yeah, that's Victor Pross. I know who he is. He's, he's been doing this for years. <laughs> he's been using our stuff for years. And it, it's just been like a constant. Yeah. And he, he said that he was making a movie. I think he ran an Indiegogo campaign to make this. Uh, independent film about him. It was supposed to be released in 2012. There's no IMDb entry for it. It does not exist. It's never happened. And he's, he, he ditched his old account where he used to talk about it all the time. And that's it. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Doesn't talk about it anymore. Yeah, so he, he's, I found a, he's a drawing an absolute of Michael fraud, Jackson. 100%. I've, yeah. I've got a Michael Jackson drawing that... It was a painting. It's autographed. Okay, oh. I'm okay. I did. I I just did a Google image search for Michael Jackson, Victor Prost to see if it w would come up, and I don't mm. see anything. So yeah, because he probably didn't. Anyway, it. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Is it? You know, I, you know, I'm not a collectivist, so I don't want to say all Ayn Rand people are are disreputable. <laughs> the guy well, who went and for some him. reason, for some reason, guys like him always seem to have come from Ayn, the Ayn Rand school. <laughs> But to be fair, I don't know why. To be fair to the Ayn Rand school, Justin Templer, who who exposed him as a fraud, <laughs> is an objectivist. <laughs> so, all right. Like I said, I, I'm I'm not blaming all objectivists and, and, <laughs> and painting them with that broad brush. But for some reason, it just seems like the most douchey members of the libertarian community end up coming. Somehow, they've been they were objectivists. Yeah. I don't know. 
it could a lot just of be, ones, you know, so, my... Yeah, it's probably yours because the, the few that I know are really, really good. I remember it was like Exomniverse, who used to be on YouTube. Uh, Aaron White used to be on YouTube as well. Aaron0883. Um, Justin Templer. Yeah. Justin Templer is a minarchist now. He used to be a Rothbardian. Traitor. I know you're listening. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, you know, like, uh, you know, like, remember, for as for those with fixed principles, sometimes we are wrong. Yep. <laughs> sometimes you were right, and now you're wrong. No. Yeah. So, and, and if if you're wrong, don't admit that you're wrong. Just say like, why is everybody so stupid that they can't understand my position, and then never clarify. That's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to work. Yeah, I, I don't know. And drink Budweiser. Man, that article was so weird. That's 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 so like I understand Jeffrey Tucker likes McDonald's and M and M's and okay, yeah, subpar stuff that's cheap and Americans can get. I can no, I think that. this is a parable. I think it was a parable. Okay, I don't. I don't think he's. I don't. I don't think he actually drinks Budweiser. I think he was just trying to use this as as sort of a broad analogy about uh, libertarians that have lost their way. Yeah. And have succumbed to this these terrible terrible forces. <laughs> With Budweiser, or... <laughs> <laughs> because Budweiser is really a bad starting point for 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 libertarians. Like not just not just saying that the flavor is bad. Like they're one of the companies that own like there's like what is it InBev, which owns Anheuser Busch now, and Miller Coors. Like those people own all the just distribution chains. Like they control what beer goes on the shelf. You cannot be a home brewer and then want to move into commercial beer, you know, the beer industry, without the express like blessing of these distributors. Like they control everything. They even control like where your beer goes on each shelf at every store. <laughs> like this is not a good good organization. At well, all. I, you know, I guess I'd be more concerned about this this. Um, this abuse of their power if I had the slightest trouble getting any kind of beer I want at any time, yeah. anywhere I go. So I don't really feel like I'm missing out, but, uh, you know, they, they've got, a, there's a lot of reasons to be uh, anti-Budweiser. Their business practices, you know, probably are, you know, like any corporation full of, um, you know, corporatism and cronyism and payoffs and, yeah, and that's all whatever. That's the whole distribution system in America. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally. Uh, you know, it's well, we 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 haven't really fully legalized alcohol yet. Yeah, I mean, it's only <laughs> it's it was only eighty three years ago that they legalized it. We're we're going baby steps. Yep. Um, they just put at, they just started selling wine in my local grocery store. So this is you know oh, just wow. the latest blue baby step, really but like we are moving towards t towards freedom. Yeah. The, the now they have to scan really your bad. driver's license. And store it in a database. Wow! And no matter how much gray is in your beard, but <laughs> wow. I can buy wine at the grocery store. That yeah. is crazy. See, I came from California, and people think would would sometimes like come over or whatever and be like, "Oh, that's weird that California would have like some of these laws that you can't buy beer after two. But at least you could buy the beer at an AM, PM, or a gas station. And you know, and if you come from another state like Utah, that's like, wait a minute, they have beer in the grocery stores and it's over 3%. This is insane. <laughs> How are people just not crashing into, into each other on the roads all over the place? <laughs> but then I come to Nevada and it's like, you can buy anything, anywhere, anytime. Period. You just got to be 21. Well, That's it. What kind of beer do they have <laughs> at the, do they serve at the Bunny Ranch? Um, I didn't check out the beer. I had a gin and tonic because uh, it was really, okay. yeah, it was really hot out, and the kind of beer that you want for a really hot out is not the kind of beer I want to drink. So, uh, but I did notice that someone came in and had a Bud Light. Um, mm. So I, I don't so, imagine so, you're going there for good drinks. You're going there for mm. the girls to get a good drink. Yeah, of you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if I was if I was Jeffrey Tucker and I was listening to this conversation, my biggest rebuttal and defense of Bud would be his the th one of the things he points out about the lower number of calories, and he could look at a bunch of fat libertarians and be like, you know, see you guys, you guys really need to cut down on the calories. Maybe maybe I'm right. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would say moderation is the key there. Yeah. So 
um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yes, know what? many There's... libertarians could deal with fewer beer calories, but you could accomplish the same thing by having fewer excellent beers than a larger number of terrible beers. Yeah, or you drink a few few of those beers and then you move on to spirits. Or you, you, there's, there's also great wines. If, if if you like if you like all the kind of flavors you get in beer, you should probably check out some some even three buck chuck wines can actually kind of amaze you sometimes. Like I just, I just, oh yeah! I just had a five dollar bottle of Yellowtail. It was a Yellowtail Shiraz and, and Grenache. I've never had a Grenache berry before, and I was just like, "This is a five dollar bottle of wine? You got to be kidding me! <laughs> this is amazing!" And I, I felt Why like not? snobby, but I didn't. I don't care. Like, and Jeffrey Tucker had written an, written an article about how like expensive wines aren't really as good as they say. A lot of that stuff's kind of in the mind. Uh, they did some like scientific studies and showed that like even the top wine experts of the country, if you blindfold them, they can't tell uh, a five buck chuck from a you know a one hundred and twenty dollar bottle of wine. Often they can't. Some actually can't tell a red wine yeah. from a white wine. Yeah, when they put I red mean, it's that food extreme, coloring, I've heard. It. <laughs> they can't tell the difference. No, but like blindfolded, they won't. They can't even necessarily tell you what color the wine is that yeah. you're drinking. But they actually did one where they took the same wine, same white wine. They put red food coloring in one and then gave it to them. And they were like, yes, this one, you could definitely taste the tannins. <laughs> 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 There's no tannins in it. It's red food coloring. It has no flavor. <laughs> the power yeah. of suggestion is real, yes. though. I mean, yeah. if you if you like look at an apple before you bite it, you're going to taste an apple mm-hmm. Probably before your senses have recorded the apple uh, aroma and flavor. So yeah. it's kind of like that kind of test that I did when I was a kid in school, where they blindfold you and you taste like a bunch of different types of fruit, and you have no idea what you're picking up, and you're just like, "What is this f- weird flavor?" And you're like, "Oh, it's apple." Oh, now I taste it. <laughs> but at first, you don't. Yeah, it's a trip. Yeah. So anyway, it's a wonderful world of alcoholic beverages out there, and there's no need to to slum. That's I think that's (laughs) my only real takeaway from that article. It's like okay, there's um, there's good cheap craft beer too. Sam Adams, Sam Adams. I'm sorry, I I know a lot of people like to crap on him, but I don't. Uh, Sam (laughs) Sam Adams is an alt malt beer. They can get they can get pretty creative sometimes, but a lot of times they're on the bland. Well, I'm not allowed to criticize Sam Adams because they are a sponsor of the Beer and Bullshit Show. Okay, Um, but I wouldn't drink the piss. No way. (laughs) (laughs) Hell no. No, they have like some of their IPAs they come out with. I'm just like, you know what? For the price. You know, and I can get it at a gas station at four o'clock in the morning. It's it's a whole lot better than what's else on the shelf, which is you know Sierra Foster's. Nevada. Sierra, Sierra Nevada, Nevada yeah. Torpedo is oh, is my yeah, go to yeah. if I need a large quantity of decent beer at a low price. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've I've seen it in like twelve packs for like a buck a can. Mm-hmm. So, yep, I've always been amazed with with, with that. that. That was kind of like one of my first kind of craft beers. My first craft beer was Arrogant Bastard. And that was really kind of jumping into the deep end on that one, and I I fell in love. <laughs> Everybody else nice. around me hated nice. it, but yeah, I went from Newcastle thinking that was fancy to Kent <laughs> Bastard and Kilt Lifter. <laughs> I was like, right on, yeah. So, well, Kilt then. Lifter, yeah, Kilt I've had Lifter. Kilt Lifter. Is that like Arizona beer? Where is that? I think so. Or maybe Utah. Yeah. I know Bar- Baron loves to drink the stuff. One of the other co-hosts. We were drinking Kilt Lifter at. Um, Jackalope. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like in the gas stations and stuff around around that area. Huh. That's probably why he's into it. Because <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's originally from Arizona, so. Okay. Yeah, so. And are you, it is are you going this year, by the way, to Jackfest? Jackalope? I do not have that on my schedule, oh. um, unfortunately. Are you, are, are you going, and did you build your pizza oven yet? No, 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 no. Just haven't, just haven't been an opportunity. I've been, I put everything on the back burner except for my podcasts so I can learn how to program, and then even still I don't have time to do that. <laughs> like I, I really cut out everything. I cut out Libertarians Against Humanity. I've cut out uh, Liberty in the Pub. I cut out all that stuff. Still don't matter. Hmm. don't have the time to do it. All right. Yeah. So, but I've, I've been still been I still make pizza, and they still come out fantastic. Cool. But I really would like to have a wood oven. That'd be 
That would be my dream. What Hashtag about please um, donate? What about uh, <laughs> why don't you come? Why don't you bring it to Pork Fest? Uh, the the what? Bring what? Bring your pizza oven to Pork Fest. Well, I don't. There, there's the a problem. they have, have a pizza oven. <laughs> Hashtag oh. please donate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, but you're gonna. It's gonna be like a mobile. It, no, I forget. Um, I guess we had talked about a mobile, like a mobile yeah. pizza kitchen. The, but, the idea um, that I wanted to have was I could either buy one that was already pre-made and put it on a trailer, or get one that's already built on a trailer, or build get it buy a trailer and build one on the trailer, and then hit, put it on a trailer hitch, and then take it out there. Uh, and I could also take it elsewhere too. And you know, pizza pizza is a real, real fast, real easy, cheap thing to do if you got a wood oven. It only takes ninety seconds to cook a pizza in a wood oven. It's it's super fast. You know, maybe a little bit longer if you got a lot of stuff on it. But yeah. Um, but in my in my conventional oven, it's going to take about you know five minutes. <laughs> no, no, mm-hmm. I think I got it up to like seven. Yeah, down to seven rather. So. Did you know that I used to work in a pizza shop? Oh, you did. did I ever tell you that? Was it? Yeah, kind of wood that was oven style or? Uh, no, it was just traditional gas oven, um, six hundred degrees or whatnot. And uh, I worked for this. I worked for a guy that had come to the country illegally in the seventies from Sicily. Mm-hmm. He had a, about a fourth grade education in Sicily. Okay, so um, he but he he managed to come here. Got a social security number somehow that he used to get a business loan to buy the pizza shop. (laughs) (laughs) And then, so I I meet him a couple decades later, and he's got several stores. Kids are all driving fancy SUVs, living in the expensive part of the uh, Philly suburbs, like living the dream. But a flaming, horrible, horrible person. Okay. Just horrible, <laughs> misogynist, drunk. Guy was drunk all the time, drank cases of beer throughout the day. We had just stacks of beer in the pizza shop. And somebody said, Can I get one? A, it was also Budweiser, no coincidence, but he would drink like multiple, multiple cases in, in a day just for wow. just constantly drinking. And then if you wanted to get drunk, like with the guys at the barbershop next door, he'd have to go to the liquor. Okay. <laughs> but this guy, he would say anytime a woman walked by the glass, he had all kinds of things to say about her and what he should be doing to her, et cetera. Horrible guy. But he gave me, but it was cash. I was working under the table, all you could eat. Um, it was, it was kind of a cool job, but, uh, He's probably dead now. He smoked five <laughs> packs of Winston's a day. Wow. <laughs> and two cases of beer. Right. Yeah. Wow. And, and, but, uh, you know, but he, he you know, for his idol. faults, he, cre- he created, <laughs> first of all, his pizza was awesome. Okay. Uh, I bet. His pizza was, was fantastic. Okay. Because when you're a giant asshole, you got to have something else working for you. Yeah. And in this case, it was his pizza. He did, he did a great job with it. But, Sure, he'd stir the sauce with his like hairy arm, but whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> there couldn't be that much hair got in the sauce. It's the follicles that really bring out the essence of the, the Italian tomatoes. Really do. <laughs> <laughs> the oils from the skin really bring out that kind of crisp from the basil. I'm telling you. <laughs> Anyway, but I became a pizza snob, so I'm yeah. still I consider myself a bit of a pizza snob. Yeah, and have very low tolerance for poor quality pizza. Yeah, speaking of low quality pizza, I ended up having to fulfill my <laughs> obligation of eating crappy pizza. That's I don't know if you saw that post that I made on Facebook today, where I was <laughs> where I was unhappily displaying my uh, Papa John's pizza. What, Ooh, what, what happened? So. I bet I can't remember what I what my side of the bet was on, but I bet with um, Marshall Beaupre, which I'm trying to cat get out of here. I'm trying to get him to uh, do like some like some soundboarding on a couple of episodes. That'll be fun because he he likes to do soundboarding. Cat, get out of here. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I had a he was saying like I was saying like no Hillary Clinton's gonna win. This is she already has it in the bag. Why were you even talking about this? And he's like, I bet you, you know, you, you could eat a Papa John pizza, you know, if, if Trump wins. I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. 
anyone. <laughs> I've been putting it off and putting uh-huh. it off. And I was like, <clears throat> and I got this uh, this T-Mobile app on my phone that if you uh, if you have it every Tuesday, they will offer you like all kinds of free stuff. And one of the things that they offered this week was a free large pizza at Papa John's. So I was like, I, I better suck it up. <laughs> at least I'm not having to pay for it out of pocket. <laughs> so, wow. And I put bacon on it, and I had it well done, and it was it was edible. It was edible. I'm trying to. Re- I know I've had it in the. I tried it, but I'm trying to remember the last time I was subjected to it. It was probably one of those things where you're like you're at some event or something, and it's like the question becomes it's either that or nothing, and you go for it. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah, don't. Sometimes it has. Sometimes How was it? It was edible. I mean, at least it wasn't Little Caesars. And now, see, here's the thing with Little Caesars. I, I am not a fan of Little Caesars. Five dollars, it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. But their deep dish, it, it sort of is worth it. And it's not the best thing ever, but when it's it's eight bucks and you know it's two meals, whatever. But when they have their little specialty things that come around every once in a while, those things are usually always surprise me. I'm usually kind of caught off guard. They had one where they had it was a, a pizza, but it had bacon around the rim. It was a deep dish, so there was bacon on the inside of the rim, uh, and then there was a whole bunch of bacon on top. And it was the bacon overpowered just everything bad about the pizza, and it was amazing. Okay, great. The other thing they just came out with it called the Smokehouse Pizza, which was like which is like a pizza, and it's got um, like pulled pork, uh, brisket, and applewood smoked bacon. Uh, and the barbecue sauce is the sauce to the pizza, and there's like barbecue rub around the rim. rim. And I was like, "This can't be that great." <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I was like, I went back and got another one like the next day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, at least but you're yeah, willing to give seasons. them a chance too. Yeah. You're willing to you're willing to, to to let them try their, you know, their their uh, special offerings. Well, see, I only do that if I know I'm going to get drunk. And I could, <laughs> I get little that, Caesars you know, when it, I know that, you're drunk. So. It kind of reminds me of the the like the Taco <laughs> Bell like taco that's made out of a t- Dorito. Yeah. Like, didn't they do something like that? Yeah, like, they still have it's it. A, it's popular. a Dorito. <laughs> what is that popular? And they're good. <laughs> they're really good. <laughs> I was gonna say, what the fuck? <laughs> probably is. <laughs> and now they have a taco that's made out of a piece of chicken, like the taco shell. It's just a, like a slab of chicken, like a like a deep fried chicken thing, and then they put lettuce and sauce in the middle and tomatoes and cheese. It's amazing. So it's like a it's like a paleo taco, yeah, except the chicken's breaded. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know. So it's it? still Popeyes fried. Had their 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 waffle chicken. It was they put it in waffle batter and then fried it. I don't I don't know what kind of crazy scientists all these people are hiring, but man, they are they're doing some fantastic work in the realm of fast food. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to see all the things that never made it out of the design stage? You know, where they're like oh. early testing. They're like, yeah, oh, that gonna, all goes to Domino's. They all go. We're going to take a ham and we're going to roll it in cookie dough batter. You know, like. <laughs> no, I th- I'm pretty convinced all that all the rejected ideas like. Domino's buys buys those ideas for like pennies on the dollar. <laughs> so like, Oreo so pizza. if you have one of these great ideas, like who <laughs> who's the first person you market it to? You've you've just figured out something great. You go to like like maybe like Tyson Frozen Foods with this, or who's who's going to be the big the big buyer if you get your your the big the best buyer? Client? You're prob- probably going to be Yum Brands. So like Pepsi, KFC. Uh, what's the other one they own? Taco Bell. You go to them first. If it it'll, if it'll fit their markets, if not, go to Bur- uh, McDonald's, Burger King. Okay, um, and then work your way down from there. So you have Jack in the Box underneath that, Wendy's. Uh, probably, well, I know Wendy's is national, so you want probably want to go to them. Uh, White Castle's right. If I out. it did invent, let's yeah. just say the the chocolate chip dough covered ham, <laughs> and I and I thought this is going to be great. Deep fried. How could I present that to Taco <laughs> Bell without them just stealing my idea and and cutting me out? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, you could probably make them sign an NDA before you do it. <laughs> like I have this wonderful idea, to sign this NDA. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Mm. 
I don't know. I don't know how that industry works, but it, wouldn't it be fun to sit around and try to dream up these ridiculous food things and see see which ones yeah. fly? The, the the here you go, a churro made out of cookie dough, and still like soft Why cookie not? dough in the middle. Yeah, and you, no, you just sell them on the streets outside of a Taco Bell, and maybe one of them will come out and be like, "That's amazing." Let me call corporate. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably how it works. Yeah, like yeah. like they can operate a phone. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? It's called a landline. I don't know what that is. <laughs> can I just use my cell phone? Can I text them? <laughs> all right. Oh, man. So, all right. Do you have anything you want to plug? So I guess you're not talking. <laughs> at the I got. Yeah, it looks like I'm not. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Although we will be uh, presumably still operating our Montgomery County Hospitality Suite, which is basically the party suite during the convention. So um, we're going to have a no eugenesis policy (laughs) at the the after party, at least. So that's good. Yeah, I think that's that's a good starter rule. Like, but before we figure out what the rules of you know who could be allowed in this party, let's just set a little framework here. The obvious, you know. No, no KKK, no Nazis, no, uh, no fascists, no eugenicists, uh, and no literally Hitler if he rises from the dead. Can we just at least agree on that one? Okay, or let's just now, start with, look, yeah. if, if you want to centrally no plan the human race down to the molecular level, you're not welcome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, I'm, I got to have some kind of standards, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I want to be inclusive. I don't, you know, but I'm going to draw the line there. <laughs> all right man well it's great talking to you glad to have you on the show we need to get you on great more. being with you especially on fiend phone it's awesome i know hopefully this thing works <laughs> i haven't tested it yet <laughs> if not we'll re-record the show tomorrow no i i tested it but just not on fiend phone it's just gonna be the same thing but anyways uh i'm gonna say it i don't care worms Worms. worms. I'm at the point now where I'm just like, <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to say it naturally anyway. So, yeah, worms. Tired of dealing with governments? Wish there was a better way of not getting busted committing victimless crimes? Tired of having to listen to your parole officer? Never again with the BitCot NoGov Human License Wristband. This wristband has a NoGov patented NoGov hologram technologies that work on your aura chakras to fungus shui vibrational energy something something to woo state agents off of your trail. It's like they can't even see you. The best part is it actually works. It doesn't actually work. It's so easy to use. Just put it on your wrist or within three inches of your quantum sacred geometry spirit energy and commit all of the victimless crimes you want and totally get away with all of them. Them. And by all, we mean none. And with the fancy Lowbirds podcast logo on the side, you'll be the life of Porkfest. And all of this can be yours for $4.99 plus $2 shipping and handling. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, FTC, or any other three letters. This product is not intended to prevent, defend, or protect you from any legal actions from the state. This product contains chemicals known in the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. Move to New Hampshire, Nevada, or anywhere else that isn't a shithole and you'll probably be fine. These bands are total bullshit. They don't actually work. If this needs to be said to you, you should probably drink bleach. This is just neat looking merchandise that can start an interesting conversation with yet to be libertarians. Order today at Lulberts.com. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists like Barack Obama and Al Gore taking credit for the web while trying to take over the web? Are you disgusted by experts whose concept of the internet is that it's a series of tubes? Take back the free market of computing by encouraging software developers to adopt the BIPCOT NoGov license. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows any use or modification except by governments. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango, dot org. For some reason in, in this country, and in a bunch of Western world, it's okay to just judge. Hey, this is Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends Radio Show. Computer programmer Derek Slopey and I have created Fiend Phone. I'm using Fiend Phone right now to talk with and record one of my co-hosts in real time. Take it, Davi. Hey, this is Davi Barker, and I'm a thousand miles away from Michael, but we sound like we're in the same room. We sure do, Davi. So, Davi, please tell the nice people more about FiendPhone. FiendPhone is free, no-gov software that opens up a global world of possibilities for collaborative, high-quality, remote voice media production, and I'm digging it. People can try FiendPhone right now at FiendPhone.com, but we're also raising money to vastly improve FiendPhone and vastly improve independent talk media worldwide. So go to FiendPhone.com to help out. Who will build the audio roads? We will, with your help.
That's fiendphone.com. F E E N P H O N E.com. Foxtrot Echo Echo November Phone.com. Fiendphone. I never knew remote audio could be this good.